Now to our opening statement spotlight. Defendant Jonathan Quillis is accused of raping his niece and then murdering her when she became pregnant with his child. This morning, because of this case, we want to take the time to shine a spotlight on child abuse cases and talk about what we can do to prevent them. You know, Ayanna Sawyer, she was allegedly abused by someone very close to her, her own family member. And that's somebody you're supposed to be able to trust and feel safe with. But in Ayanna's case, and in so many other cases just like hers, that family member, that safe space, ends up being the person who hurts them the most. He would grope her in various areas or like kiss her neck or her lips in like an inappropriate way. I was on one end of the couch sleep and um, IS and the defendant were on another um, having a sexual encounter and I could hear and feel the couch move. Did you learn the IS was pregnant? Yes, ma'am. Did you make an accusation? Yes. And who was that against? Jonathan. And did your sister tell you who was the father of the baby? Yes. Who? The defendant. So how does this type of abuse happen right underneath the family's nose? Here to answer that question, we're bringing in two great guests with personal and professional experience with sexual assault. Survivor and activist Jody Ploche, who was abused by his karate teacher before his father shot him on live TV back in 1984. His story gained national attention and Jody has been a sensational advocate for child abuse prevention ever since. Also joining the conversation, award-winning nationally recognized parenting and family expert, Dr. Sue Cornbluth. Uh, Dr. Sue and Jody, good morning to you both. Wonderful to have you two on the show. Uh, uh, Jody, I, I, I want to start with you, please. I applaud you, sir, everything you were doing. We need more people like you, strong survivors who are willing to speak out because this is so pervasive. I want to start there. It is so pervasive. And here in this case in Florida that we're broadcasting right now, Jonathan Quillez is alleged to have abused his niece right on the couch. Now, his wife could testify today and be a really key witness in this case about that. How does it happen underneath the noses of people who love a child so much? Would you speak to that, please, Jody? The first thing that a perpetrator does is they gain the trust of not only the child, but usually of the parents, the family, and that way they can get away with it. In order for someone to abuse a child, they have to be alone with them. and. In order to be alone with them, they have to gain that trust of the family. Right, right, Jody. You know, I, I'm not an expert in child abuse cases, um, but I do have experience working in the criminal court system. I was a prosecutor. To me, it, it starts with trust, then it goes to boundary testing, and then it goes to isolation. Uh, Dr. Sue, you are the actual professional here. Uh, tell me, you know, is this line of thinking about right in terms of what us lay people should be thinking about in protecting our kids? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Julie. Thank you so much for having me on. Nice. We're talking about a topic that is so serious, and we need to have a better understanding of this. You know, 30% of all sexual abuse cases do happen uh, by relatives, and we need to be aware of the signs of what is going on so we can prevent this. And yes, things happen right under other people's noses. And why does that happen? Because the perpetrator is grooming them. The perpetrator is telling them they're special. The perpetrator is telling them that this is okay. And they're impressionable. And who knows what kind of self-esteem issues that they're coming with or they're experiencing. And they want to feel loved and cared for. And we have to be aware of how they're groomed. Right, right, Dr. Sue. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's really messing with the mind of an innocent child because they can very much like their abuser and enjoy them. You know, and these are children, their brains aren't even fully formed. And yet these predators uh, are very savvy and very savage how they take advantage of them. Uh, Jody, would you speak to some of the, the grooming process that Dr. Sue was just mentioning, uh, if you don't mind sharing uh, in your own situation? I mean, you're a 10 year old innocent child you know, and, and this predator uh, decides to, to make you a target. Uh, speak to that if you would, please. 
Well, one of the, one of the things that he would do was he would give praise to my parents about how good your kids are at karate because he was my karate uh, instructor, and. You mentioned test boundaries, and that's another thing that's really important because they're looking for the perfect victim, someone who's not going to say nothing. And by testing their boundaries, they can gradually get to that point to where they can have a, a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Right, Jody, exactly. You know, if, if a kid responds to something that may seem kind of harmless or innocent, you know, questionable conduct, and the kid seems very, uh, you know, upset by it, you know, that's a sign to the predator to, hey, back off. But, you know, uh, it, children, you know, aren't... Um, you know, raised to, you know, be forceful and be looking out for these things. You know, they, they don't know any better. And so if, if a child seems to kind of acquiesce because they trust the individual, remember the trust comes first before the boundary testing, you can see absolutely how it happens. Huh, Jody? I, I mentioned in my book one of the things that kind of bothered me when I used to wait tables is when a parent would say, um, they'd look at their kid and be like, what do you want to drink? And the kid would be like, uh, I want a Coke. And they'd be like, okay, get him a milk. And I'm like, that right there, you're telling the child like their their opinion or, or what they want isn't important because the parent has that trump card. And that's the same thing with you're, they're taught with any adult. Hey, you know what? Get up and let Uncle Johnny sit down or Uncle Paul sit down. You know, we do that to children and we shouldn't. Right, you're right, Jody. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and Dr. Sue, uh, to dovetail off of something that uh, Jody said, you know, also trust is gained with parents too. It's not just with the child, right? Uh, these these predators, they are so sick in the way they, they calculate how they're going to sort of manage the situation with gaining the trust there. So that can be so hard for parents, isn't it, Dr. Sue, to see through that? It's like, how do you know who you can trust? Well, you're absolutely right, Julie. It is so important that one, we educate our children as parents very young about predators and what they can do and the manipulation tactics that they could use with the child. This is an important conversation to have with your children. Don't be embarrassed to have it. We have to have these conversations to protect our children. Jody made a great point there when, when he said that, ask your children what they want and validate their voices because then they will be able to use their voices in situations where they feel unsafe or threatened. Yes, yes. I love it, uh, Dr. Sue. I, I have a clip I want to play for you and Jody now. Uh, this is some testimony in the Quillis case where one of uh, the victim's aunts is talking about how um, the defendant would look at her. It was a look that she noticed that just didn't seem quite right. I know how my dad look at me. I have um, male par partners and I know how a grown man look at me. And I did not like the way he looked at her. All right. How many times would you tell this jury you saw him looking at your niece, I.S., in the way that you felt like you're describing now? I would say at least maybe more. So it was at family functions. Mm. And Dr. Sue, we know, you know, hindsight is 2020, of course. Obviously, this family is devastated about what happened uh, to Ayanna Sawyer. And going back in time, I'm sure things seem a lot more suspicious now. But when you're in it, it can be hard to look for signs. Uh, can you share with us some things, some things that all of us can be looking for when it comes to protecting our kids and what we should watch out for uh, with potential predators? Yes, that's a great question. And I want to give that aunt props because I watched that clip last night and she went on to demonstrate how you look at someone and how you don't look at a child. So props to her and that she did notice what was going on. Look, there's many behaviors that go on when a predator is trying to groom a child. One of them is that they're spending a lot of time around the child. Notice how they're behaving around the child. Are they using a lot of behaviors such as putting their arms around them, praising them, bringing them gifts a lot, telling them that they're special, things like that, taking them out to do things without the parents being present. They appear as very compassionate and caring people, but behind closed doors, they're not. They're sometimes terrifying, and other times they are as compassionate as can be 
trying to convince the child that these acts are acts of love. So these are some of the behaviors that parents need to be aware of. It's not okay to let a 16 year old spend time with somebody that is 38 years old Mm -hmm. all the time or most of the time. These are things and signs to look for. Right, appreciate it, Dr. Sue, thank you. Uh, Jody, a last point with you, please. I wanna bring up uh, the isolation component, you know, because we know these predators, they want children to never go and tell their parents or somebody in a position of authority who can then out them, you know, and have them uh, jailed and prosecuted. So they, they seem to kind of isolate uh, their, their, their victims. And for children, that can be so hard. Children are not to blame. They have nothing to be ashamed of, but yet there's this fear of getting in trouble if they come forward. Um, so what would you say, Jody, to any parents who want their kids to know uh, that they can tell them anything and they're not gonna be upset with them and they will protect them if they share with them that an adult has been inappropriate with them? One of the things, again, that I mentioned in my book is that a parent needs to watch their language. They need to watch what they say. For example, um, people ask me, well, why didn't you tell? Why didn't you say anything? And my answer was because I knew my dad would kill him. And that's exactly what my dad did. So if a parent, and and they're doing it in a good way, they're going, you know what? Um, If anyone touches my kid, you tell me and I'll kill him. Well, guess what? Most of the time, that's a trusted adult. Like you mentioned earlier, it's a family member or a close friend. And that child doesn't want that person harmed or they don't want their parent to go to jail. So then they'll keep it quiet. That's what I did. I was just, I'll keep it quiet until... It stops. And sure. if, if, if I don't go to the hospital, I may have never told. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And that's many, many people. I bet so many viewers watching this program right now have the same situation. This is such a common problem, and I'm such a believer of yeah. talk about it. Talk about it. That's how you breach it. That's how you out these people, by making them uh, know that there's more awareness out there than they realize. Uh, and, Jody, your book, uh, we have a, a picture of your book. We want to put it on the screen, let everybody know. Um where they can uh, buy it. Uh, Jody, where is it available, please? It's available on Amazon.com. Uh, you can, uh, it's called Why Geary mm-hmm. Why. And it's also available on audiobook and digital copy. So you can get a paperback, digital, or you can get an audiobook.